If I asked you to tell me the difference between an adjective, an adverb, and a preposition, you'd probably say something like this. An adjective modifies a noun. And an adverb modifies um, an adjective, an adverb, or a verb and another adverb. And a preposition, well, that, well, I don't have to go on, because I think we all might have had the same kind of trouble with these kinds of definitions. In just a few moments, we're going to show how we can be much more precise in identifying adjectives, adverbs, and prepositions by going to structure rather than meaning. In our last program, we were talking about the structure of words. How words were formed by morphemes. That these morphemes were divided between bases and affixes. And that to have a word, what we had to have was not only a single base and only one base, but that we had to have a word superfix or a stress pattern. That if we could have a base and a word superfix or stress pattern, that by definition gave us a word. And by the same token, if we had more than one base, we had, by definition, more than one word. Now, also in our last program, we showed that we could identify nouns and verbs and pronouns by the inflectional suffixes or inflectional morphemes they took, the endings, if you will. We found that nouns could be defined or identified immediately as words that could be inflected for the plural, who could take, which uh, words that could take the Z1 morpheme, that verbs were verbs when they could be inflected for the past tense, or the D1 morpheme, and that pronouns were words that had a very complicated inflectional or suffix inflectional pattern. And they were the ones that had inflection both for subject and object case and for two possessives. Now today we're going to do two things. We're going to move on in our consideration of grammar. In other words, the study of the word is the first level of the study of grammar. And now we're going to see how we can get past the study of the single word into combinations of words. We're going to see how we can put words together and see how combinations or compositions of words together can be added to other words until we get out to our sentence. And at the same time, we're also going to see how we can identify words within these particular combinations. Now, we've already found out on our program here that the word white and the word house can go together. We've used this particular example of white and house in several of our programs. For instance, we found that when the word white and the word house was put together as white house, that this meant a house that was colored white. When we had the word white put together with the word house so it sounded like white house, that this was something quite different. This referred to 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. And when we put white and house together in such a composition as white house, that meant the house owned by the white family, in contrast, say, to the house owned by the Smith family. Listen, it was the white house, not the Smith house he went to. Now, actually, the thing that was operating here was first a combination of more than one word. We're putting two words together, two bases in each of these items, and they were done in terms of the stresses. In other words, it was listening to these stress differences that enabled us to tell which word went with which in what way. In other words, when a secondary stress goes on the word white here and primary on house, that's the thing that gives us the, the adjective noun kind of business, white house. When we had, however, a primary on the word white and a tertiary on house, this gave us the thing, that particular composition that referred to 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, where the present lives, White House. Please notice, however, that in terms of what we have already covered on this program, White House is not one word. It is two words 
That is, it is a phrase because it is composed of items that have more than one base. So White House is a phrase. Now over here, White House said this way with secondary stress gives us another signals, another relationship between the word white and the word house, gives us another phrase, something that refers to some another thing in contradistinction to all these other two, to all these other words here. Now, the secret of this whole business, the secret of syntax, that's the technical name for putting words, more than one word together. The secret of syntax is that it is always a combination of binary elements, that is, two by two. And also that the particular arrangement or composition of these things, two by two, is signaled by stress. Now, we may remember again that every word to begin with had a single primary stress. The primary stress of the word superfix. Now, here are our two words again. Here is the word white by itself, the word house by itself, with the primary stress of the word superfix on it. Each word has to have its primary stress of the word superfix. Now, when we combine them, as we've seen, with white and house together, notice what's happened. The primary stress of the word superfix on white has had to yield to a, a degree of stress, a stress one degree lower. House has remained with its primary stress as it was when it was a word. This new combination now, again, is what we call a phrase, and the word superfix of one of the words has had to yield to a stress one degree lower. Now, in the case of putting white and house together in this particular combination, where white keeps its primary stress, but house goes down to tertiary, we get again this other combination, white house. And in the third one, the primary stress on the word superfix of house has had to yield a secondary stress to give us this business of white house. I mean, pardon me, of white house the house owned by the White family, White House. All right, now, this whole business then is first given to us in terms of our ear by the stresses. But that is not the whole story. There is something more that also is present in a pattern to tell us how words go together in phrases. And this is what we call the transition or juncture, how words get joined. Now notice. Here is the word nitrate. It is one word, only one base, and has a word superfix of primary stress and tertiary stress. Now, please notice how the T and the R go together here. The T and the R follow each other in exactly the same way as the T and the R follow each other in the word tree or the word try. The R has that friction noise on it, that voicelessness. And this is the way T and R normally go together. Tree, try, nitrate. This kind of transition, or going from T to R, we call normal transition. But notice the difference in the way the T and the R follow each other, or go from one to the other, in the phrase night rate. Night rate, now, has a kind of T in it, which is the kind of T that ends a word. Sight, flight, night. The R of rate is the kind of R that begins a word, fully voiced, rate, run, read. Now, this particular kind of transition between T and R we call plus juncture. And in other words, what puts the word night and the word rate together in a phrase is not only just the matter of the stresses, but also how these particular items go into one another, how they transit, if I can make up a word, one into the other. Now notice a couple of other contrasts to show you how plus juncture operates. Here, nitrate. A trait owned by a man named Nye, or exhibited by a man named Nye, perhaps the late Senator Nye. A Nye trait. Notice here the plus juncture comes at this point, Nye, whereas the T and R now go together in normal transition, as they did up there in, in trait, up there in nitrate, or as in treat. And a secondary stress here, on this particular way of putting these together. Now notice, in the case of these two words, basket report. Basket report. The plus juncture comes between the T and the R. This is a report on baskets, or a report, perhaps, that's residing in somebody's basket on his desk that he doesn't intend too much about. A basket report. But when I say basket report, and put the plus juncture in front of the P, after this particular uh, business here, basket report, now is a port that has to do with the importation or exportation of baskets. Basket report. In other words, where these particular things occur is of extreme importance. And the combination of these stresses and the kind of juncture is what we call the phrase 
superfix. And the phrase superfix is the key to how words get put together. Now, for instance, here are same words again with the pictures over here of the superfixes that are combined with them. Here is the word nitrate with its word superfix. It is obviously a word because it has only one base and that little W in the root sign, the root sign here tells us we're dealing with a piece of grammatical structure. That little W in there tells us that's a word superfix. When I leave out the W, I am immediately saying phrase superfix. So the picture then of the phrase superfix that puts the word night and the word rate together in the phrase is this one. Picture primary stress plus juncture tertiary stress. For nitrate, primary stress, stress plus juncture secondary stress. For white house, secondary stress plus juncture primary stress. For white house, primary stress plus juncture tertiary stress. And for white house, the house owned by the white family, primary stress plus juncture secondary stress. These phrase superfixes then, these are the key to how words get put together. And remember, in each case, when they operate in putting words together, one of the words of the word superfix, one of the stresses, pardon me, of the word superfix of one of the words has to yield. Now, looking then at our phrase superfixes, we actually can find that bringing up from our lower level of analysis, namely our morphemic level, the words we've already identified as nouns, verbs, and pronouns, we find that if we find an uninflectable word, a word like white, which can never take a suffix, like our, you know, our business of the Z1, the plural suffix, and the D1. In other words, this thing is now an uninflectable word. It's not a verb, it's not a pronoun, and it's not a, um, uh, a noun. All right, now, when I put that uninflectable word into a phrase with the noun house, under the superfix of secondary stress plus juncture primary stress, I have identified the thing that I was taught to call the adjective. There is what an adjective will be. Any uninflectable word preceding a noun, which has primary stress on it, when it has secondary, is an adjective. Same way here in shaggy dog. The word shaggy is uninflected, secondary stress plus juncture primary stress. Shaggy is an adjective. But this particular phrase superfix of secondary plus juncture primary is not only used for adjective noun but it also can put a noun and a verb together in the familiar subject verb phrase, as in John Rand. It also can put together the verb and its object, as in hit bill. Secondary stress plus juncture primary stress. Now, remember our pronouns. They were our third inflected word class. And actually in our pronouns, what we have here is a phrase superfix which puts tertiary stress on the pronoun and primary stress on the verb. So I went. Pronouns generally occur in a phrase superfix with tertiary stress. Here is the object pronoun, which not only occurs with a quite weak, the weakest stress, but also it follows the verb generally in normal transition. Teller, see him, get him, find it. Object pronouns occur under a, fra a phrase superfix with weak stress and normal transition. Now, in every one of our phrase superfixes, one thing we've noticed and one thing we must constantly bear in mind Every phrase superfix has to have one primary stress in it and one that's reduced. All right, now, let's see what we can do with our business of the prepositions. We said the prepositions and the adverbs could also be immediately identified if we went to structure. Okay, let's take this one. Here's the word set and the word up put together in a phrase superfix of tertiary plus juncture primary. Uh, set up the pins in the other alley. Set up is a verb, right? That is, it makes now a compound the compound, which is a verb, set up. But if you put the phrase superfix of primary stress plus juncture tertiary, in other words, just the opposite, then you get the thing was a setup. And that now is, functions as a noun, right? It was a setup. Now, when you say upstairs and put this thing together with tertiary stress here and primary stress here, you get upstairs, right? Or up the stairs. Notice there's tertiary stress here, primary stress here, tertiary stress here, primary stress here. These are nouns. Now I can define for you or identify for you the preposition. A preposition is going to be an uninflectable word that can be put together with a noun after it, can be put together with noun or verb in front of it, as long as there is only a tertiary stress in the entire phrase, then you've got a preposition. So up is a preposition because it exists here only in a phrase that has primary and tertiary, never more than tertiary. Here's another example. The city tore up the street. The city tore up the street. Happens in New York every day. 
This particular tertiary stress here shows me that that word up is a preposition. The house he came to. Tertiary stress on this item here shows me it's a preposition. Uh, he came to. Let's reverse these. He came to. Now notice, I've got primary stress on to and tertiary stress on came. The to is still a preposition because there's only a tertiary stress in the phrase. Now notice, the sports car tore up the street. Secondary stress now on tore. When there's secondary stress, any item that follows is by definition an adverb. Hear it again. The sports car tore up the street. Quite different from the city tore up the street. He tore it up. Primary stress out here. Secondary on that verb, that's an adverb. He came down. Secondary stress here, which again tells me that this particular item is an adverb. So I can, without any problem, distinguish even the same word, if you will, the up, in terms of its function syntactically as a preposition and its function syntactically as an adverb in terms of the phrase superfixes that it is found with. In other words, what we have said so far lets us realize this, that we have an ability now to put words together and seeing how words get put together in terms of these phrase superfixes. This allows us to then identify the function of each of the uninflected words, now based on how they go with other words. Once we have already identified the words, we can identify on the lower level through how they are inflected. Now, it so happens that this business of our phrase superfix doesn't just take care of these items we've been talking about, but I could go ahead and I could identify, for instance, conjunctions, and I could identify um, articles, other kinds of uninflected words, depending upon how this business goes in the phrase. But that's not all. In other words, the phrase is, of course, the most important single part. As I move up from single words, the phrase is extremely important. But I can also see that my sentences ultimately are composed of a series of phrases. Again, I use my binary principle. In analyzing, for instance, the phrasal structure of this sentence, the girl caught a taxi, what I do is to enter here at my finite verb and move to the end, and the first phrase I've got that I can take out composed of two words is the word A combined with the word taxi under a phrase superfix of weak stress plus juncture primary stress, a taxi. Then caught a taxi, I have the word caught, a new item added to this, which is now a unit. This now counts as, a, as one part of a binary composition, caught a taxi. Then this whole business, caught a taxi, counts as one unit, and I move up to this particular part, the girl, and the girl itself is a phrase composed of the word the and the word girl under a phrase superfix of weak stress plus juncture of uh, secondary stress. Uh, th this one has been reduced in this particular sentence from a primary stress. So, now, I can then look at a sentence like this and I can see its phrasal composition phrase by phrase by phrase. Phrase by phrase by phrase. Now, sentences, however, are composed, as they are here, by, by binary phrases. Now there is another item that we have to notice. That is, if the, the business of our stresses make a phrase superfix, and we can see how the phrases can be added one to the other, the thing that really tells us about how a sentence operates is the intonation pattern. You remember that we had in earlier programs, a treatment of intonation. We found that we had four pitches in this language, four degrees of relative pitch that we kept apart. And we numbered them one, two, three, four. One being the lowest, two being the next highest, three being higher than that, and the highest one of all four. In other words, from one to four. Now notice, in this particular sentence here, are you reading Macaulay? Notice, please, that I say all of this on pitch two until I get to that primary stress where I go to three and I remain on three, and then I go up at the end, and that was what that little double bar meant. That showed how I ended this particular intonation pattern. Now, an intonation pattern always includes a stretch that can have only one primary stress in it. So when I say, are you reading Macaulay? What I've said is, are you reading a book by an author, the author named Macaulay? But when I say, are you reading Macaulay? And I put a single bar juncture in there, and put a primary stress here and put the three there, I have now two intonation patterns. The word Macaulay now forms an intonation pattern all by itself. 
stays on three, goes up to double bar, and now, because of what I've done with the intonation, I now know that I'm asking a person named Macaulay whether he's reading. Quite a different meaning than in this sentence up here. Now, here's an example of pitch one, very rapidly. Are you reading, Macaulay? Here again, two intonation patterns. I'm still talking to a man named Macaulay. I have a single bar there, and I've come down to pitch one at this point. And over here, I've gone off into my double cross juncture, a fading off, gradual fading off into silence, and a gradual diminution of intensity. Now, here is an example of pitch four. Why are you reading Macaulay? Here the man wants to know why is the person reading an author named Macaulay. And here is pitch four with a primary stress. Again, only one intonation pattern goes down to one very rapidly after this, and then ends up in our double cross. In other words, this particular kind of way of breaking sentences up into intonation patterns immediately tells us, in looking at these examples, whether we're talking about an author named Macaulay or whether we're talking to a man named Macaulay, but that's not all. Actually, the intonation patterns tell us a tremendous amount about everything that goes on in every kind of sentence. Let's take a sentence now, a simple subject and predicate sentence, like they decorated the girl with the flowers. Now notice, they decorated the girl with the flowers. I have put a single bar juncture here. Here is my primary stress and my pitch two, two intonation patterns. What I've said here is this. This tells me, this single bar, that I have ended my verb right here, and that all of this material in this intonation pattern is the direct object of decorating. They decorated the girl with the flowers. All right, now, when I say, in contrast to this, they decorated the girl with the flowers, what have I said? I've said something quite different. I have said that at this point, I have ended the, the actual direct object, and that this particular item now, with the flowers, is in quite a different relationship than before. What did it mean up here? It simply identified the girl, if you will, as the one who already was equipped with flowers. They decorated the girl with the flowers, not the girl with the hat. But down here now, they decorated the girl with the flowers. I have obviously said that the decoration of this girl goes on in terms of the flowers. And again, it is this particular intonation pattern stopping here with double bar, going to three and two, that tells me how these particular constituents of this sentence are set together. In other words, ultimately, everything that I'm going to be doing in syntax, the whole of English grammar passed the business of just putting words together into their phrases is going to be done in terms of intonation patterns. So that if we have phrase superfixes that are composed of stresses and internal junctures, perhaps we could call and should call the intonation patterns and how they work sentence superfixes. And if I only listen, if I only listen to the phonological signals, that is to the actual pitches and stresses and junctures that go on, I have the basis for a completely formal, structural grammar. In other words, I don't have to resort to meaning. I can get at meaning, ultimately, through structure. But I can never get at structure through meaning. Just as I have seen that I can actually define or identify my parts of speech, my word classes, through linguistic structure, and then go on to meaning, in other words, I define my noun first, and then I can say a noun is the name of the person, place, or thing, after I've found out what a noun is in, in contradistinction from a verb in terms of structure. By the same token, then, here, what I can do is to actually see how my sentence works. No longer would I have to puzzle my head as to what went with what. If I just listen, I have the answer. In other words, syntax, then, in the whole of grammar, is based ultimately on phonology. It is based on this whole matter of what noises I hear. To summarize, then, our very rapid survey of grammar, what we have to realize is that on our last two programs, we have gone very, very rapidly over a very, very complicated field. We've only been able to touch the high spots. But I think that if we remember the points that we've made, that we actually can see the basis, again, upon which grammar can and must be based. And that is, ultimately, we have got to realize that it is the sounds of the language that are prior to everything else. We've got to be able to listen to our sounds, to our phonemes. That these particular sounds are going to give us, ultimately, all of our basic 
ideas of how things go with other things. At the same time, we've got to keep the idea of levels apart. That is, when we are talking about words, we can only be talking about words. And we have to understand that the composition of the word is essential to understand first and to get out of the way before we can see how more than one word can be put together. And you may remember again that that word had to have one fra uh, uh, superfix in it, one stress pattern, and one base. And that if I got two bases together, by definition, I had a phrase. And how those particular things were put together to make the phrase was told me again by the phrase superfix, the arrangement of stresses, ultimately. Because one of those primary stresses on the word level had to be reduced when it entered into a phrase to some stress lower than, I mean, uh, lower than the primary. Now, we also found that when we were looking at words, we could classify and identify our words in terms of whether or not they could take inflectional suffixes. And once we had the nouns and the verbs and the prepositions out of the way, then we could go on to our phrases. And the last thing that we must remember in this whole business is that even though we may think that a composition ought to be a word because it refers to only one thing, like White House, if it's got two bases in it, if it's composed of two words, it's by definition a phrase. In other words, in this way, we can get again at meaning through structure. Meaning through structure. By listening to the phonology. Ultimately, then, the whole sentence unfolds itself in terms of the intonation pattern, and again, those pitches and terminal junctures must be listened to. Now, for our program next week, we're going to be talking about historical linguistics. Historical linguistics and something about the history of this whole field. Actually, it is from that part of linguistics that we call historical or comparative linguistics that the entire field as we know it today developed. And in our program next week, we are going to be talking particularly about how languages are related. This was the thing that concerned people in the early days of linguistics. They found out that there were vocabulary items that seemed to be quite similar and mean quite similar things. And they got the idea that the languages were related. And they found out systematically how they could prove that languages were, were related. And this whole business leads us to a consideration of what we call language families. And we're going to be looking at how we can set up different kinds of language families. And we're going to see something about our own language family, which is called the Indo-Hittite or the Indo-European language family. We're going to see how we actually can reconstruct the forms, many of them, of the parent language from which all of the related languages of our particular language family came. In other words, we're going to be able to push ourselves back in time to about 3500 BC and see what our family looked like and how ultimately English developed from it. Be with us then, won't you? is National Educational Television.